It's not that we just fast from a certain type of food or drink or social media or whatever that might be, or TV, but that we also replace what we're getting rid of with something more spiritual, maybe a little bit more prayer, intentional prayer, a little bit more Bible reading, a little bit more giving back to uh, the community or giving back to the church in a sense of serving in the church. Welcome everyone to our uh, 30th podcast of Renew Your Mind. Um, I can't believe we're to our 30th podcast. That almost doesn't even seem possible. Um, no, we're always on our 29th. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should have left it on 29. <laughs> um, so here today with us today is Senior Pastor Paul Gruenberg and our family and youth pastor, uh, Pastor Jordan Chambers, and myself, Dana Hall, as the moderator. We are all uh, <laughs> we're all recording on behalf of the First United Methodist Church. Um, we are located at, at 215 South Center Street. And if you have any questions after the podcast, feel free to call us at 989-732-5380. So again, today is February 17th, 2021, and um, today is the day of Lent. And I thought I'd just dive right into it and ask one of the pastors, what exactly is Lent? What does that, what does it mean? And, um, you know, do a lot of people know what Lent is? I'll leave it as kind of blunt or simple as that. So, Well, what Lent is, is it's a time of uh, repentance. It's a time of reflection in how you are living your life in relationship with God. And one of the interesting things as far as for me going back and thinking about Lent is that it did not biblically it was not commanded for us to do. Uh, Jesus didn't say, hey, you know, 40 days before I die or raise or am raised from the dead, uh, you need to gather together and become repentant. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that Jesus instituted in that regard. Or in fact, we could probably go so far as to say that God instituted directly uh, through Christ or through the Holy Spirit. We don't see that in the apostolic writings. Uh, so there's not a biblical foundation in the sense that 46 days before Lent, you're supposed to have ashes on your forehead and, mm -hmm. and then um, Holy Week and in, in stuff like that. In comparison, there is a biblical foundation for like communion. You know, Holy Communion was the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper. Mm -hmm. Jesus not only performed it, but required it, you know, and Paul emphasized that as well. Same with baptism. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ went through baptism, requires it. You know, he asks us to go through the same. He did a time of 40 days of fasting, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a time where he said, all of you have to do the same thing like baptism and communion. And that's where, you know, as far as the biblical foundation goes, of whether it's not a biblical thing, because mm -hmm. there is, there is going to be some precedent. Mm hmm you know, especially if you look at the temptation of Christ um, and, and the 40 days leading up to that, mm -hmm. he ate nothing and he, he was out in the desert and, you know, he, he went into isolation. Um, that sets the precedent that it's obviously healthy for us to do some kind of isolation, you know, spiritually at least, to mm -hmm. take some time to reflect, to, to let go of how much this earth has a hold on us. But it wasn't like he says, all right, I did it, so you can too. You sure. Know? It's not mandatory to do it on this specific yeah. day and time. Okay. Right. All right. So is that why some people choose to, what I want to say, um, participate in or recognize Lent and some don't? So not all people grew up in an environment where Lent was celebrated as a part of the church calendar or the seasons of the church. I grew up in a home where... As Lutherans, we celebrated Lent or we participated in Lent. There are other churches that do this too, the Anglican, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Methodists, Moravians, the Oriental Orthodox, the Reformed Presbyterians, Roman Catholic churches, Anabaptists, and some evangelical churches all celebrate or participate in the season of Lent. And the origin of the season of Lent didn't come around until probably the 
some say it's the the church at, or the Council of Nicaea uh, where it was instituted. Others will say that maybe it was another hundred years, uh, about four hundred years. It would have been about three and a half hundred years. Can you say that three and a half hundred? <laughs> yeah, three hundred. Did <laughs> yeah uh, after sense. Christ. Yeah. So there were some church fathers, uh, patriarchs of the church, mm -hmm. so to speak, that. Uh, came around to a time of understanding, as Jordan talked about earlier. Uh, Lent is often seen as a, a time in the desert, uh, okay. corresponding to the 40 days that Christ spent uh, in the desert being tested, uh, being tried, and uh, coming out on the other side fully, uh, fully intact with God, never giving an inch to the devil. Mm -hmm. So in that, our relationship with God, the idea behind Lent is that, again, as Jordan said, we try to separate ourselves from the world a little bit more intentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, some people, fasting is a big part of Lent uh, in the Catholic Church. That's why you have uh, fish on Friday, mm -hmm. uh, because that is a part of their fast. There are other things you can fast from, and in today's day, if you can fast from technology, you know, that would yeah. be a fast. Uh, put your phone away. If you need it for work, you use it for work. But after that, or some people would say you fast from social media. Mm -hmm. uh, can you imagine some people who are on Facebook probably an hour or two a day fasting from Facebook mm -hmm. or Twitter or, or whatever it is? But there are many ways you can fast. Uh, food. Uh, some people give up sweets or pop or caffeine, coffee. I don't know how for those. many times people have told me what they think I should fast? <laughs> what what might that be? Oh, yeah, uh, Mountain Dew. Yeah, every time. definitely. Like, at least three people per year, guaranteed. So you're giving up Mountain Dew for Lent this year? <laughs> it's guaranteed. I'm going to get. <laughs> so there are so there are a lot of people who have been raised in an environment where that season of the Christian year is celebrated because it leads us also to the time of the cross. It leads us and prepares us. That's, I guess, a time of preparation for when Christ will rise from the dead. So our focus is taken off of the world a little bit more. And then the other aspect of fasting for me it's not that we just fast from a certain type of food or drink or social media or whatever that might be, or TV, but that we also replace what we're getting rid of with something more spiritual, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more prayer, intentional prayer, a little bit more um, Bible reading, a little bit more um, giving back to uh, the community or giving back to the church in a sense of serving in the church mm -hmm. or serving others through whatever cause um, uh, really gets your engine going. Yeah. But and the idea of getting away and then also adding in uh, maybe a spiritual component. I think that's what kind of hit it home to me is, you know, everyone's so focused on what do you give up, but how you said, you know, that will give you more time to do something spiritual or to mm -hmm. prepare yourself or to remove you from, you know, the worldly things. That's what hit home to me. Yeah, I think there's a couple, I think there's two main uh, spiritual, you could either say focuses or motives. Disciplines. Yeah, to, to doing Lent. There's reasons, I guess, that would drive someone to do it. But just to get back before we get to that, it, to your original question, which is why do some people not participate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Please. we want to get that side. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, you know, he was just talking about, um, Pastor Paul was talking about the calendar year and how a vast number of churches use the, the liturgical calendar as a guide for the way they live their Christian lives, for the lessons that they study out throughout the year to keep them focused on points, whether it's, of uh, you know, leading up to the cross and all those things. Um in the 1800s, especially, there was a push against the liturgical everything, not just the calendar, but liturgical garb, liturgical, um, even, even like tapestries in the church and the presence mm -hmm. of symbols in the church. 
Um, in fact, there was a church, it's called the Christian Church, and out of that, we now have the Church of Christ, which was originally, that's that's how they became uh, an, an entity. Um, the founders called themselves the Disciples of Christ or the Christian Church, and it was exclusively, um, they called it non-iconic. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. basically everything that had any kind of symbolic meaning they removed with the exception of the, the cross, even to the extent that some churches removed instrumental music, um, required only a cappella singing, because they felt uh, that the structure and the program began to be what was worshipped much more than mm-hmm. the things which they were supposed to represent. And while that may or may not have been true, it led to this culture um, of appreciation for the freedom of of Christianity. Mm-hmm. So other other denominations adopted not necessarily the theology, but the mindset of being able to celebrate your Christian life not based on a calendar, mm. but rather throughout the year as you need. You know, for instance, for fasting, um, unfortunately, because there's such a large focus on Lent as the time of fasting, it's the only time right, that right. people practice. Yeah. And in contrast, there's there are some folks who would say, uh, you know what, I don't want to participate in Lent or I don't want to be a part of this calendar liturgical format because I think it would lead me into not practicing or it would it would disencourage me or disincentivize me from doing it regularly. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. there's some folks that have their prayer closet and they spend an hour or two in in just private time. But if you relegate it to just 40 days, mm-hmm. you know, the, the one month and a half leading up and you just make a practice out of it, you know, routineness can be great, but it can also be a detraction sometimes. Yeah. And I think that there's a large number also, I'll just say this, there's a large number of ignorance uh, uh, as far as Christians go about Lent. There's a ton of people who their only knowledge of its um, practice, of its benefit and all of that is that it was just something they were told to do when they were young. Yeah. Right. And that's that's a major turnoff for a lot of people to the point that they don't want to pursue it, um, mm-hmm. even if it's worthwhile. And they won't even give a chance to see if it's worthwhile or not because, you know, it was just kind of a rammy jammy thing when they were young and, and they did it's a knee-jerk reaction. I don't really want that. Sure. So I think there's a couple of reasons why. There's some theological reasons. I think there's some cultural reasons mm-hmm. um, why people don't participate in Lent. There are a large... You know, a lot of, like, most Baptists won't participate in Lent. Um, There are certain groups, again, like the Churches of Christ, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, There's a lot of different groups out there because it's kind of evolved. It's not really been a consistent across the board. There are Baptist churches that practice Lent. There Mm -hmm. are Baptist churches that don't. But there are certain denominations that are more prone than not, you know, to to celebrate it or to not celebrate it for Mm -hmm. sure. And most of it, I think, has to do with whether or not they use or appreciate liturgical aspects in sure. the church. And it's not then, then it's not just Lent. You're talking about a lot of other things, too. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. All right. Well, that helps to understand that better. I mean, I guess it's encouraging to hear there's freedom of different ways to recognize Lent. It doesn't have to be on, you know, like you said, per a calendar. But probably, you know, what I was thinking of is that there— there's many people that just don't know what Lent is. You yeah, know? right. They right. just do it because they're told told to do it. So that's why I like how you explained what is the purpose of Lent. Right. And, you know, with Lent, you, you, there's probably a lot of people, by the way, that know what Mardi Gras is, which mm-hmm. they don't know what Lent is. That's, that's They little, know what Mardi Gras is. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's actually attached to Lent. It, it is. They're, they're actually very much. So the idea is Mardi Gras is a day of indulgence before you have to give up everything. everything. You just have one good day of doing whatever you can get away with. Or Shrove Tuesday <laughs> or yeah. uh, Punch Keys, right? Yeah, Fat Tuesday. Yeah, the idea that you can just eat whatever you want before you, you know, fast it <laughs> off. But, you know, with, with Lent, I think there's two major spiritual reasons that some people will do it. One is is just a fast because um, they they recognize that certain things are in their life and they want to they make a, some kind of like sacrifice. To mm-hmm. God, they want to give up something just to honor God with sacrifice, mm-hmm. which is not a bad concept. Um, but if you look again at the at the biblical origin, which you know we talked about, how it's not necessarily the the, the precedent 
um, but it's just where it comes from. When Christ fasted, it was for a very specific purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was a preparation purpose. It was a reason um, to basically get his mind in in the absolute best spiritual position as possible uh, to prepare him. And then right after that was his test on if, if it was complete, you know, it was when the devil tempted him with the greatest of temptations, you know, the, especially for the someone world can be yours, you right. Know? Who had been hungry. He, you could yeah. turn these stones into bread. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been fasting for a long time. Mm-hmm. Bread looks, looks really appealing. good. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, the, uh, the significance of 40 days, uh, Moses was on the mountain for 40 days with God at Mount Sinai. Uh, then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights for Noah. So there's a significant number. Uh, 40 has a significant meaning mm-hmm. in regard to that uh, time of uh, testing or a time of trial or a time of drawing near to God. The uh, interesting thing about Lent is, did you know that it starts on Ash Wednesday, which is actually 46 days. Well, I caught that when you said 46. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. So I did not realize You that. didn't take the bait. Yeah. Uh, actually, it is 40 days, and you don't count the Sundays. Oh. Right. Yeah, I so because Sundays okay. you get the day off. <laughs> well, gotcha. And we should, I should have known that. <laughs> so if you're fasting, you're right. fasting six days and you're having a day of rest, well, which is not really what you Catholic, want to do. Um, which this grew up in, you know, this, this originated in the Catholic church before there was a, 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 a schism. And um, in the Catholic church, they have a very specific outline of how they would like people to practice right. Lent. And it very much has to do with your diet and there's mm-hmm. things you are and are not allowed uh, to do, of course. Um, and Sundays are the, the days of relief, if you will, in that. Mm-hmm. So that so that it's not unhealthy, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, <laughs> right. in certain ways. Well, you can even go back to Passover. They were not allowed to have any yeast in their bread. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are times when God says, hey, don't. Yeah. Right? So there's... Again, without having read through the patristic fathers to understand exactly why it is they decided to do this, what we do know is it's a time of preparation for Easter, for the celebration of Easter. Uh, It's a time of drawing near to God. It's a time of separating yourself a little bit from the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I like how Jordan did say that the concern is, is that we relegated only to those days prior to Easter and that we don't... Uh, contemplate doing that more often in our life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many really spiritual people will actually fast weekly Mm -hmm. or will choose different times throughout the course of the year to fast for several days or a week or or a period of time. And again, fasting isn't always giving up all food and just doing bread and and water. Mm -hmm. Fasting can take different forms. But for me, a part of fasting is also adding a spiritual dimension uh, during that time so that you're not just giving up something for God, but that you're intentionally adding something to grow closer to God. And just could you just throw out um, a few more ideas that you mentioned a few, but what's something, you know, that that someone could add? Um, well, you Just know, a list of things, I guess. Think in terms of relationships, uh, forgiveness. Okay. Uh, during your fast, you're going to forgive regardless of whether you feel like it or not. I mean, Jesus does require us to forgive. He doesn't say when you feel ready to. Uh, so offering forgiveness, um, you know, uh, wearing only white clothes. No, I'm just kidding on that one. But just... Uh, Reading spiritual, spiritually minded books. Um, again, I said give up TV or um, limit your television to just thirty minutes a day. Uh, boy, Jordan, come on, help me out here. Well, when my first time, my first experience with fasting was when I was a a young man, and we were in this competition as a church where we, we got to go to camp, but in order to get scholarships off the camp, we had this test 
that we had to take. And the test was all content of memorized verses. And throughout the mm. year, you were supposed to be mm. okay. memorizing, memorizing verses. verses yeah. yeah. And so um, I, being the person that I am, didn't take the entire year to do that and decided, <laughs> I'm a smart enough guy. I'll just do it the few days beforehand. And I miserably failed the test. <laughs> like 20, 30%. <laughs> and my mom was not impressed with that. And uh, she petitioned my case. They said, okay, he can. He has three days and he can retake the test. Oh. And so my mom said, okay, he'll be ready in three days. And I went home and per my own volition, I didn't, you know, my mom didn't make me do this. I want to make sure that there's no, you know, child abuse <laughs> situations arising. This is definitely something I decided to do. Uh, but I didn't eat any food for three days. I locked myself in my room. I had water. I was drinking water. But I simply memorized scripture for three days. And it worked. I got like an 80 something percent on the test. It was, you know, I was, uh, my memory of all that was way more retentive. And I was able to, you know, it wasn't the exact same test. It was the same verses, but not the same test. So it's not like I could just remember the questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my first experience with fasting was giving up food and, and really any entertainment at all for three days straight just to memorize scripture. And it was a worthwhile presence of time. I mean, I had a little bit of an incentive <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. for it. But at the same time, it's it's just not a bad idea because I don't think we do that kind of thing enough. We don't read scripture enough. Right. We don't memorize it nearly enough. Yeah. At and, all. Yeah. yeah and, and, really. And if we were to, to put, you know, my mom always grew up telling us, Jordan, you're such a smart boy. The way you memorize movies, if you just memorize scriptures, the way you could quote movies, you'd be just a fantastic preacher, you know. <laughs> uh, she would always say those kind of things to me, but it's true. We put so much of our memory in our cognitive yeah. uh, abilities mm -hmm. toward these cultural entertainment values. Yeah, We put very little toward the spiritual biblical values. And, you know, it, it's hard to, to memorize scripture and to keep a consistent uh, pursuit of memorization mm -hmm. Um, but for some reason, it's really easy. You know, I could probably quote the entire Princess Bride to you right now. You know, the, the entire <laughs> movie. I could probably redo the whole script right now. Let's not. Let's not, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, it's true, is, you know, the things that we enjoy and that are entertained by, they grab our attention sure. immediately. And those are the kind of things we need to give up in pursuit of the spiritual and biblical things that we ought to have. And so what I think a good way, maybe, you know, there's a lot of things that could fill the gap, but maybe a good way to, to wonder what should I do mm -hmm. is ask yourself this question, what am I lacking in my spiritual life that I need more of? Mm -hmm. And what do I have in my secular or non-spiritual life that I have too mm -hmm. much of? And there's your imbalance. And you, you take the what away that you are, have too much of. Mm -hmm. And you start adding the things you need that you don't have enough of. And, and you know, you create that balance back of, of living a spiritually focused life. Yeah. Okay. So one of the, let's leave with this. Mm -hmm. uh, our one-year Bible group has been reading through. And one of the things that was noted the other night was how Moses argued with God. Now that's the second person up to that point in scripture who had argued with God, Abraham being the first. And it was noticed that the reason that God argued, or I'm sorry, Moses argued with God was that Moses had been up on Mount Sinai, received the tablets, and then while he was gone for 40 days, the people down there were like, hey, where's Moses? Uh, he must be gone now. Hey, Aaron, Moses' brother, second mm -hmm. in command, hey, can you make us a new God? And we'll worship him as the God who got us out of Egypt. And uh, so God is like to Moses, hey, Moses, you better get down there quick. In fact, I'm just going to destroy them all and start over with you. And Moses was like, no, you can't do that. What will the Egyptians think? That you brought us all out into the desert to kill us? Uh, what will your name look like? Mm -hmm. And so Moses was concerned not for the lives of the people so much as for how others would perceive God. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge that I offered out to the people in the study and, and to anyone who's listening to this is take 40 days and make sure when you pray, it's not something for you. 
but that it's something that will glorify God. So if all of my prayer time is spent on seeking to glorify God, what would that look like as opposed to my prayer time today? Where it's God, I'm in this situation, help me. God, I'm, you know, this or that. A lot of our prayer time is often either personal, I need help, or somebody else has, you know, been suffering mm-hmm. or somebody else has lost a loved one and we're lifting them up. Uh, that's a way you can glorify God is interceding for others. But what would our prayer life look like if when we get to the point of supplication where we're asking for help or needs, what would that look like if our focus was to glorify God? You know, yeah. uh, so Jordan talked just a moment ago about how I got a a terrible score. And so on one hand, Jordan went into his room and he fasted and he, he just immersed himself in scripture and God honored that. Mm-hmm. But there was a level of Jordan. Now, if you know Jordan, Jordan wants to do things well. And especially when it comes to thing, the things of God. Um, that's one of the things I really appreciate about Jordan. He, oh, always, <laughs> he always has God um, first and foremost in his mind. And so... Uh, When we do things, how are we going to honor God as a result of that? And then the other aspect of that was, uh, if you're going to spend some time in prayer, add confession. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's one area where I think a lot of people, when they talk with God, they just skip over. We We don't confess that we have fallen short or that we have sinned or you know, whatever that might be, misspending money or shopaholic or, you know, whatever that might be, unforgiveness. You, if we were to confess that, I think that's probably the one thing that if we did on a regular basis, we would become much more humble people. I wanted to interject and I'll let you finish because, you know, I wanted to continue that thought. But the same principle of Lent applies with Ash Wednesday and repentance in that mm-hmm. You know, we can make a day or I don't want to say a holiday, but we can make almost this calendar time where we decide to make a step of repentance. And, you know, we receive the ashes and we commit to the phrase saying we repent of our sins and go on our separate ways. And that's covering us for a year. That's mm-hmm. not how it's supposed no. to work. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not confession. That's not repentance. That's, that is, that's ritual. Mm-hmm. That's that's like the Day of Atonement for the Jewish uh, people. Yeah, which again, it's not improper to celebrate repentance. It's not improper to celebrate atonement. Improper, I should say. It's not improper to celebrate a, atonement or or repentance or anything. It's just improper to make that celebration your only inclusion of it. Right. Or to be so laser focused on that being the one day we do it that we just avoid it or ignore it or forget it the rest of our Christian life. And really it's supposed to be a daily thing Mm -hmm. that it's, it's supposed to be a part of us. And I think one thing I wanted to just pop in is if you can't do that daily yet, but you do it more often than you have, I think that's a great, a great. You're always looking to grow from where you are. It's a step forward, right? Just figure out how to grow forward for yourself. So, and I would even, I would even say uh, as the last thing you do at night, when your head hits the pillow, that would be the time to do just two to three or four minutes of self-reflection, um, asking the Holy Spirit to show you where you have fallen short and just simply confess it to God. Just say, God, I'm sorry. I recognize that I said this or that I did this or that I didn't say this or I didn't do this to honor you and just forgive me for my sin. Mm-hmm. And you know, the amazing thing is that God, God simply forgives you and your slate is wiped clean. Uh, that's the glory. One of the glorious things about God is that God does forgive us when we confess it, confess any sin. And I think you sleep better at night too, knowing you mm-hmm. have the peace of forgiveness. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. it's just an overwhelming sense that when you empty yourself of you know, your mind and your soul, when you empty that of all the, the sin and the negativity um, that, that has been included, you say, oh, I can't believe I did this today. But knowing, asking forgiveness, and then knowing you are forgiven gives a unique feeling 
that cannot compare to just pretending that it didn't happen or trying to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's really uh, an often time what we try to do, <laughs> you know, is mm -hmm. just bury the hatchet that's, you know, in our hands. Yeah. And uh, while we're still holding on to it kind of a thing. And, yeah. um, you know, it's just better to let it go. Yeah. So all this Excellent. from Lent, huh? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. A bit of a rabbit trail, I guess. <laughs> well, I think we're going to wrap it up on that note. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, both of you, um, for sharing uh, what it what it means and how um, we can um, honor God in different ways and participate in Lent, not participate. You know, a lot of different different ways to look at it. So. Thank you to all of our listeners. Um, again, if you want to join us, um, we are at 215 South Center Street, First United Methodist Church. Um, we uh, have a Facebook and YouTube um, live stream services, or you can join us in person at 9 a.m. and 1045 on Sundays. Or you can even watch a Sunday afternoon now that there's no football. Oh, <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks.